Hey everybody, I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me. Today I'm going somewhere that I have known about since I was a little kid. My grandparents took me here. I'm in the Black Hills of South Dakota and we're gonna check out the Chapel in the Hills, which as I understand it is modeled after a millennium old church in Norway. And I'm not letting you see it yet, but I can see it from here. And it's insane, it's gorgeous. So Brian here, I believe, Brian? Yeah. I'm Matt. Hi, Brian Kringen, yes. Yeah. And my understanding is you take care, you do everything but pastor the place, is that right? More or less, my wife and I, yes, yes. We're the managing directors. Between the fact that we're talking about something that's modeled after things in Scandinavia, and the fact that I see this hat sitting right here that has that Lutheran mm -hmm. heart logo on it, mm -hmm. is it safe to assume that this is in some way connected with Lutheranism? Right, we are considered a uh, partnership ministry of the South Dakota Synod of the ELCA. So that's Evangelical Lutheran, Lutheran Church, Church in America. In America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you have services at the church? We do. We have them three nights a week in the summertime, Wednesday nights, Saturdays, and Sunday nights, 7.30. When we get up there, I want to ask you what those are like because okay. it's, no, it's hard for me to picture. It's yeah. such a different environment. But <laughs> I, before I go up there and, and pick your brain about it, this is a really unique building. Can you tell mm -hmm. me about what this does? Well, this building... Uh, is called a stabur, which literally translates to a storehouse in Norwegian. Okay. okay. And this one it was actually built in Norway in uh, 1968. They disassembled it, brought it over here, and assembled it on site when they were building the chapel. So if you walk up to this place like a normal human instead of the way I did it, mm -hmm. which was bewilderingly through your lawn because I thought it would look cooler, <laughs> but like if a normal person came here, they see this stuff first, yeah. and kind of hiding between exactly. the, behind the trees here, they see this magnificent yep. thing. Yep. Can we yep. walk up there and yep. get a we'll sense of there. it? Yep. I mean, what are the broad strokes basics? What am I looking at here? You are looking at a full-scale replica of uh, a church that's still standing in Norway that's over 800 years old. Okay. There's records of that church standing in the year 1170. And it's still there? Yep, it's called the Borgen Stave Church or the Borgen Stavkirke. And it's arguably, arguably the most famous church in Norway. The stave churches are very important to the Norwegians. There's a couple dozen that are still remaining. At one time, there was probably over a thousand that were built because they are the first style of architecture that was built by the former Vikings when they became Christians. They just kind of did what came naturally to them and built in their old style and adapted it to this new, this new religion that St. Olaf brought over. Right on. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so would buildings in this style before St. Olaf and before the Christianization of the Norse, would something like this have been dedicated to Odin, Freya, Thor? Could have very possibly been. In fact, I think they think that a lot of them might have been built on some of the old pagan temple sites. Like right yeah. over the top. Yeah, possibly. So yep. in keeping with like, was it St. Boniface who had the confrontation with the, uh, with the pagans in Northern Germany over the oak tree dedicated to Woden? Oh, and supposedly yeah, yeah. he was able to cut it down and nobody could cut it down. Oh, and okay. So it seems like though that that kind of Northern European missionary movement in the Middle Ages had a lot to do with encountering the power of the old gods. Yes. Yeah. Versus the power of what Christians would say is yep. the oldest God. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of part of what brought about that conversion. And you see, and you see that. I mean, we got, well, there's four big dragon heads up there. Now this they normally wouldn't be on a church, you know? Think about the gargoyles down in the big cathedrals in mainland Europe. Okay. You know, all those grotesque things trying to scare away the evil spirits or whatever. We're not positive why they're up there. But a good, a good guess is that, you know, the dragon was a symbol of, of good fortune and protection and so forth, I guess, for the old Vikings. That's why they were on the ships. And so maybe they just naturally were, maybe they were hedging their bets a little bit with this new religion, you know? <laughs> okay. And so we're going to put them up there. And you got to give those early missionaries credit. Because like missionaries do today, they listen to the culture, they listen to the old practices and beliefs and symbols and so forth. And if they can adapt them to the new religion, they'll do it, give it a little bit different meaning. So now they're up there, again, kind of protecting anybody who goes inside. So, anyway. okay. But you'll notice now, of course, the new symbols of Christianity, there are 10 crosses on the outside, okay? And so they were learning all these new symbols also. And what I find interesting is that each one of the crosses is slightly different. I suppose over the centuries, one breaks off. Another carpenter comes along, puts one up there, his own style on it. And yeah, this one over here looks a little more Celtic maybe. Yep, uh-huh, yeah, there's that kind of double stuff on it. 
I, I don't know if you are a Norse gentleman. I have a lot of that in my blood. Mm -hmm. So I think the tasteful way to put it would be that the Vikings engaged in a lot of cross-cultural communication. Of course they did. Yes. By that I mean savage raiding. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I wonder how many of those cross styles just came back from yeah, spring raids. Knows? Yeah, right. One of my favorite symbols is way up there at the top. Is that a See that weather vane? See what that is? Can you tell what that is? Is it a dove? No, it's not a dove, but it is a bird. It's a rooster. Why? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a symbol of St. Peter. Peter's denial of Christ the night before the crucifixion. Sure, sure. Remember? Okay. So before why would that go on this church? Oh, you'll see them all over Norway, on the old churches and the new ones. One of our good friends that, that has visited the chapel here before, I asked him, I said, I understand this, the, this, the symbol of St. Peter, but why is it up there like you asked? He said, it's a, it's, it's a reminder to us not to deny our Lord. Huh. So over there in Norway, whenever you go by a church and you see that rooster, you're reminded. Live that good life. L live that honest, upright life and don't, don't deny your Lord. I think that's kind of cool up there. I think it's really cool. Yeah. So we can take a yeah. look inside? Yeah, sure. Now, it's interesting when you come through here, you go through the first opening, but we're still not in the chapel. Okay. We're in what they call an ambulatory. This little covered walkway that goes all the way around the chapel. These exist in Gothic churches, Romanesque churches. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. inside, inside, right? Inside, right, yeah, yeah. But it had a practical purpose. Again, you got one extra layer of steep roof here. Mm -hmm. So it protects the foundation. These staved churches were just basically laid out on a rock foundation. Okay? Genius. So it does okay. that. And then, of course, it protects people. Let's say you beat the pastor or if... Uh, you know, maybe I should stop right here and say that uh, if I say pastor or priest, I'm not wrong either way because in the 1100s, th this was long before Martin Luther, sure. so it was built as a Catholic church. And it remained that way until the Reformation. So, so really half the life of the church yes, this exactly. one is modeled That's after yeah. is Catholic. Yeah. Half of it is, Luther. is yeah. Lutheran. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah, and, it and, and maybe built over the top of... Right, pagan right. ruins. And yeah, who knows, right, wow. exactly. Wow, yeah. yeah. it's a religious journey yeah. through time. So people, you know, let's say you beat the pr priest to, to mass that day, and it's snowing out or raining out. You've got you got the ambulatory yeah. to wait in. And then the most colorful story about that is the men were supposed to leave their weapons out here. Can't bring them into the house of God. And again, in, uh, in Norway, even if it's a modern church, the first little entrance in the church, we call it a narthex in our churches here sure. in the United yeah. States, okay? Theirs translates to the weapons house to this day. They really? talk about taking the weapons off and before they go into the church. So That's I could cool. maybe, if I go to church in Norway, bring like a really blunt sword and just be <laughs> so like, guys, it's like just, I Viking, just want to yeah, do it. You like, got to do it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so Ragnar then... Ragnar going to church. Yeah, the main entrance here is the most elaborately carved one. But if you look carefully and you, and you go back, you'll see this dragon motif again. They're intertwined. Some people think there are dragons intertwined with serpents. We're not quite sure but they're struggling and biting each other's tails and so forth. So again, you could kind of say, maybe in their minds it was this struggle between the old and the new or the good and the evil. Well, and the and way it, some of these dragons are presented, it reminds yep. me of the peacock motif. Almost, yes. That I see yeah. in a lot of Catholic and Orthodox churches. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the phoenix, that yep. idea of rebirth that's Who built knows? into You're some right, of that yeah. imagery. Can I ask you a question about the actual physical door before yeah. we go in? Yeah, I don't know much about it, but there oh, might have okay. been something simpler at one time. So we don't know when this hardware was, was added. There's a snowflake symbol that I've seen in Norse mythology oh, okay. and imagery that this reminds me a lot of that I don't remember exactly what it's symbolic of, but uh, the deity of Odin or something like yeah. that. So I kind of yeah. wondered if maybe yeah. that was an attempt Very to repurpose possible. that toward Very possible. something that points in a different maybe. direction. But if you're telling me they got that at Menards or Home Depot, <laughs> no. then I'm, I'm guessing... <laughs> Right. I'm guessing they don't have yeah. a uh, repurposed pagan images no, for Christian no. theology and worship section there at Home Depot. So, no. But see, you see the see the little dragon heads. I do now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm coming in. I'm all kinds of excited. I'm not going to pretend like I've never seen this before because my grandma took me here when I was a little boy. This is the most unique, most beautiful, most stunning church that I've been to in all my travels. You just don't see anything like this. Yeah, it's quite simple too in, the, in, in a way, isn't it? Uh, one, one thing, okay, that's not authentic in here is that if we were here back in the 1100s, there would have been no benches here. You would have stood for the mass. Okay. The only seating was these seats along the, the wall. If you were elderly or infirm, you could sit down, but otherwise you had to stand. Imagine that 
you know, here's priest up there, probably from a different country, hmm. doing the mass um, in Latin, of course. Right. And you, you kind of wonder, what did these former Vikings, they must have thought, what did we get ourselves into? Don't even have the same characters right, to the alphabet. Right. But, but yet, somehow it worked. And that's what's interesting about the whole story. Is How do you that think it worked? it worked? Why do you think it worked? Well, they, were, they became Christians, <laughs> you know, and uh, the gospel took hold up there. So you'd attribute to, rather than a social factor, just the actual miraculous work of God to transform you people's would hope. hearts. Yeah, and, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. It really is. The Borgen Church is, is, is owned and operated now by uh, the Norwegian Historical Society, okay? And back in the 1800s, when they, when they purchased it from the local congregation, they made a conscious effort to try to keep it as authentic as they could, okay? Because lot, as I said, a lot of the others have been transformed so much, you don't really know what the, the original church looked like. And so they said, this, when you come here, that's what it makes it famous for, is that it's the best representation of what these churches probably looked like when they were first built. Do they Which, still worship there? They don't, actually, their new church is right next door. Their new church built in the So they're the not 18, taking the risk. No, right, exactly. Wait, their new church built, you started saying In the 18? 1860s, yeah, <laughs> their new church. Uh, and that's the, what they call I'm it. I'm from the yeah. American West. Like, yeah, the new yeah, church was built right. in 2006 yeah, by the housing yeah. development. And, and, yeah. and again, I might be wrong in this, but if you are a member of that congregation, you still have rights to have special services in the, in the historical church. Oh, my. So, yeah. <laughs> I wonder how many other places on earth there are where you could get married in a wood church mm -hmm. that your direct ancestors were married in right. 900 years exactly. earlier. Yep. That's, a, mm -hmm. yeah. that's a very unusual thing. You know, are they, are they, I mean, I wonder if they have members whose I'm names sure, have been I'm on sure the rolls back are. to when it was built. You know, uh, when we were in Norway, I, I got to see the church where my great-grandfather was, was, uh, was raised in. And there's the baptismal font, and the basin itself has a date on it, you know, way back in the 1100, no, 1300s, I think. And so you know that that's the basin where my great-grandfather yes. was baptized in. And his great-grandfather. Yes, yeah. And his great-grandfather. Yeah. And yeah. you could probably keep going a few. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, we lucked out there. The funny so. thing for us is the, the most historical church thing that I can point to with my family is we know the exact site where the king executed my great 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 granddaddy <laughs> in Litchfield, England. Okay, <laughs> That's all we go. got. Well, so it's not as, as happy a memory yeah. as a christening or a baptism, yeah. but yeah. you know, we got something. Yeah. It just yeah. smells more of burnt human flesh. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. So on that positive note, yeah. how many people can you fit in here for a service? What we say, you know, if a bride calls us and says, "How many? I want to have an inside wedding. How much can I have?" I say, "I wouldn't go over 50." Uh, you can get 70 to 80 if you really want to cram them in here, but then it's not going to be very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And there's not a good seat in the house. The, the posts are in the way, you know. But That's uh, the Bob Eucher seat, right? Yeah, the, the exactly. Morning. Yes, yes. Yes. And some people call these the staves. There's some old Norse word for pillar that kind of sounds like stave. But the experts also say the reason these are called stave churches is not really because of the columns that are exposed, because sometimes you don't see the columns. But it's the walls. Look at the exterior walls. They're vertical, vertical tongue and groove. And, um, and it, it, you can about imagine you are in a barrel almost. And staves in a barrel are vertical like that. Oh. And so that's where that, that stavakir could probably comes from. You've got all the X-shaped bracing. You've got the little arches that go out. So they're almost probably like miniature flying buttresses, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so, so we're distributing the weight yeah, outwards. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And everything's tied together with these X-shaped braces. Here's one of those, uh, those stories that have developed. That X-shaped brace reminds somebody of the cross of St. Andrew. St. Andrew being one of Jesus' first disciples. As a matter of fact, he told Peter that, hey, I found this Jesus guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Tradition says that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross in the early days of the Christian church. It's the Scottish flag, right? Yeah, and, it's, and he's the patron saint of Scotland. And so you know where they got that idea from. Gee right. whiz. <laughs> Probably, the, you know, it's just across the North Sea. And... Uh, um, and so I'm sure a lot of the early missionaries probably did come from Scotland. So yeah, yeah somebody's, oh, it's across the St. Andrew. It's all over here. And it just keeps going up and up and up. In a lot of ways, it looks like a uh, upside down ship in some ways when you look up there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. you said it's the nave. And yeah, yeah. Nave, and nave, naval, all that stuff, yes. Carries the, the crew, yeah. the passengers on mm -hmm. to and not Valhalla. Seen, but, but yeah, to heaven but now. To heaven, yeah. right. 
you know, and that's where that's where the, the, the pastors and the priests, they had the license now to go with it. So like in this particular church, there's 12 pillars. Coincidence? Probably not because whoever built this thing figured they needed 12. But it was probably somebody later on that said, oh man, I got, I got the 12 tribes of Israel right here. I got the 12 disciples of Jesus. I've got 24 weeks of sermons built in already. Yes, okay, did. right? Yes, or anything did. like that. But then if you haven't noticed them yet, Look up and around, and you will find 12 faces staring down at you. They don't all look human. No, they don't, do they? So you can't, if you want to say they're the disciples, well, okay. Wouldn't you love to hear the sermon about this one right here, this guy? Well, it looks like a bear. Okay. Well, indeed he does. So here's my working theory. I was seeing this kind of fox-looking one. Yep. I was like, well, Jesus called Herod that fox at one point. Could be. Maybe that's a derogatory term for a sellout yeah. or a yeah. fraud. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe Which that Which disciple was... do you think that one might be symbolize? Well, I assume that would be Judas then, but do we do, we do monuments that. to Judas? Because we do Matthias, know, right? right? Know, yeah. Like yeah. You don't make statues again, for you, Judas. So who, but a lot of people have said that, that it might personify uh, Judas, but okay. But then you could go with that if you wanted. If you wanted to say, okay, if uh, somebody's giving a sermon about Judas and betraying Jesus and all that, where is he? He's in the back. No, he's he's checking there. things out. Yeah. He's he's planning already. How am I going to betray Jesus or whatever? So that's kind he's of interesting. Skulking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then some of these, you know, have it looks like crowns on their heads or something. So we're really not sure what these. Probably some old Norse uh, pagan characters. We don't know. Okay. Yeah. But again, it doesn't matter. If, if you want to turn them into stories. But the bear, I mean, that yeah, so, that kind of fits with, I mean, you wouldn't have a bull because that just right, yeah, culturally wasn't an animal that yeah, pops up yeah, much in right. Norse mythology. But a bear, mm -hmm. I mean, Peter personality-wise, just be. knocking Could stuff be. over, clumsing Could around. Yeah. Or even, I mean, isn't it the, the old Norse rules were that Odin and Thor, when they would travel the world, it would be in the form of a bear. Yeah, Maybe there's knows? some kind yeah. of incarnational right. yeah. notion there. And then somebody else might look at that. If you didn't see the ears, somebody else might look at that and think, it's oh, it's one of those masks, one of those masks of armor. Yeah, well, yeah. I, so here's the thing. I've been in here with you for just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You've pointed out a few things, and it's made my brain go all over the Bible, all over the story. Yeah. It gets forced me to think because of its ambiguity, but the context still points so much to Christian theology, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it's mm -hmm. clearly a Christian church. Yeah. <laughs> Is it all right if we go up here? Sure, we can go up here. I'm allowed to walk up there as a non lutheran Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So the chancel, again, has been kept fairly simple. The, um, they did keep, a, in, the one in Norway, they did keep a couple of relics. There's, there's an old... Uh, cabinet over here where they probably kept the, the bread and wine, you know. Okay. There's an altarpiece that dates way back that they figured they should keep that. And they actually do have one of the big old walk-up pulpits over in this corner. But oh, again, uh, they know that that was added during the Reformation, so they decided not to. Okay. But this is pretty common, okay? Simple altar, stone altar here, all Black Hills uh, metamorphic rock that everything is built here. And, uh, but this altar cloth you go into almost any church in Norway, you're going to see a Hardanger altar cloth like this. Hard, They'll have different Hardanger? styles, but it's called Hardanger. Okay. Hardanger, uh, there's a Hardanger fjord, so there's a region in Norway, and this type of embroidery came out of that region. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. Why do you have a kneeler? In Lutheranism, you know, is, the liturgy is very close to, to, the, to Roman Catholic liturgy in a lot of ways. And now when I was growing up, the pastor would kneel a lot more than they do nowadays, of course. But there would be times when the pastor would kneel, of course. And so we kept it in here. And there are some pastors that like to keep the tradition of if there's a wedding in here, that the, the, for the blessing of the bride and groom, they gotcha. kneel too. So they'll bring it out and put it out there and so forth. So yeah. I can't read your Bible. No, that's, and, that's weird for me. And a lot of young Norwegians might not be able to read it either. It's in Old Norsk, I guess. So when Norwegians come up and look at it, um, they will say, oh, that's the Old Norse. So they can probably read most of it. But they say that's not how we would write or read. Am I allowed today. to even touch this? Oh, yeah. I just started grabbing it's, it's your just super fancy it's, nice No, Bible. it's an old one. We, we've got some nicer ones. I mean, the Lutheran value would be that anybody can touch a Bible, right? I yeah, mean, that's the yeah, thinking. Yeah. This is the book of wisdom that all Catholic Bibles would have. You're still okay with me just kind of oh, rifling yeah, through ahead. here? Yeah. yeah, it's an illustrated Bible. So it's it's gonna... beautiful. I like the way it's beat up. I got mm -hmm. burned. Look at that. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Somebody yeah. ran up here with a jug of water to yeah. put it out. Yeah. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. yes. 
I, I'm doing a podcast in Matthew right now. Okay, there you go. And I think it's just time for Matthew to get a little bit of press here. <laughs> there you go. We're going to go with the temptation in the wilderness. There you go. That'll be great. It's got a picture, too. I like that. It makes me <laughs> yeah. feel more comfortable. What, what happens in behind here is this. Okay, in, Nor- in, in Norway, in, at the Borgen Church, there's nothing back there except storage. Okay. Uh, that's called the apse, of course, you know, that rounded portion. They figured that was probably added later again. I want to ask about this little takeout window <laughs> right here. What, what does this do? This... Um, this is perhaps the most talked about feature in the chapel. Hmm. And it's what they call a squint. They found similar openings like that in big uh, cruciform churches or whatever, someplace where somebody might not be able to see the altar from where they're sitting. Uh, I am not Roman Catholic, but I do understand that the high point of the mass is when the priest holds up the wafer, the host, okay? And it's very important that people see that. Okay, well, if you couldn't see that, then people look through that little squint. So they kind of adapted that to this smaller church, and perhaps, maybe uh, it, was, it was full, and some people had to be out in the ambulatory. Or, probably more likely, there were some undesirables, maybe because of their odor, or yeah. who knows what, weren't allowed inside the chapel. Okay. And so the story goes then, of course, that there would have been leprosy at this time, and the, uh, the lepers just like... Today, oh, heaven forbid, we can't have them inside the sanctuary. But they were tolerated out in the ambulatory, I guess. Hmm. And so they could listen to the service and so forth. And the reason it gets that name is that supposedly from time to time, the pastor would even give them Holy Communion through the window. Hmm. So um, hmm. that's where it's, it's got that name. So just think of that. They were, they were all ahead of this pandemic stuff a long time ago. Oh, this will keep the leprosy had, out right here, had, right? They had their drive through windows and their get through there. drive through communion and all that stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I make fun of it a little bit lightly, just, you know, yeah. what we know about epidemiology and what they knew back then. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, it's yeah. kind of hard to do Christianity and treat people like lepers. Exactly. Like so that's what's neat about it. And, you have, and, you and, have to... Yeah. Touch the untouchable. Yeah. And if it only happened once in the history, you know, they were thinking about their fellow human yeah. being. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway. Can we look at a few more things outside? Sure. Yeah. There's a few other things that every, every once in a while somebody catches and they ask me about. We'll go out supposedly the women's entrance. Okay. Okay. Is that an actual thing like they make I, I the suppose. ladies go through here? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how long it lasted or whatever, but don't you know, lots touching. of cultures, you know, you got women on one side, men on the other, who knows what okay. it is here. All right. But it's a lot more plain here, of course. If you can tell me what those true creatures are, you're a better person than I am. I have no idea. But supposedly, they're, they are lions. But look down here, they're definitely lions. Oh, yeah, yeah, Okay. Yeah. And one of the symbols for Jesus is the Lion of Judah, so... That makes sense here. Again, just some symbolism. Teach some lessons as they go in. And so there are a few other things out here that some people run in, come back and, and ask us questions about, but a lot of people don't notice. So one of the things, which is actually a big mystery to even the, uh, the experts, are those, those four round carvings up there in the second to last, or third to last okay. roof up there. Some people think that they might be they might represent the four Gospels. Okay. okay. And they do. They're, they're animal uh, representations for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that when you look at them up closer, they're connected. You, you barely see, but they are connected also. Oh, yeah. And it looks like more of the dragon motif, so we're not quite sure. So these four symbols here, even though they don't look like yeah, whatever they are, the angel and the bull and the symbols uh-huh. of the uh-huh. evangelists, Still, the fact that there are four dragons, there are four of those, huh. the idea of uh, the main building being built around the four posts, it seems like imagery that would be yeah, connected be with the possible. apostles yeah. or yeah. The, the evangelists. Yep. But then the, one, the single one, up one more, then that's pretty obvious, the tree of life, reference it's, to the Garden of Eden or whatever. Or Yggdrasil. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. kind of a nice carryover from yeah. the Norse yeah. notion yeah. of the tree of life. So as somebody who's been associated with this for a really long time and who knows the whole story of it, you know the Norway side, you know the here side, what do you hope that your average visitor who's in town is a tourist family checking things out who comes and spends 20 minutes here, what do you hope they take from it? What do you hope it accomplishes? Well, you know, the chapel reaches people in lots of different ways. 
And people always come up and say, oh, you know, my grandfather was from Norway and all this, so they, it's their heritage. And then, of course, the people that come up for, for their, their faith also, and it renews their, 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 their faith there. So it's going to appeal to lots of different people in lots of different ways, but it's our hope that they come along and say, you know, our ancestors, even if they weren't Norwegians, you know, we, we bring our faith with us, and, and, and it, it's, it's still manifested this day in lots of different ways, okay? This is one small slice of what, what our ancestors brought to us. And uh, we continue that ministry. Brian, thank you, this was a oh, treat. You're welcome, you're welcome.